Well, good e afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, virtually to share with you some thoughts on what learning analytics may look like when we apply them to try and build 21st century competencies. Um, I hope that this will be a provocative um, session for you and that you will leave with some new ways of thinking about what makes learning analytics for these kinds of qualities and skills perhaps a bit different from analytics for other kinds of learning. Before uh, going any further, I'd like to just acknowledge that the ideas I'm sharing here come from uh, many places in, and especially my colleagues at the Connected Intelligence Center. But uh, I've worked with many people over the years who have shaped the thinking that I'll be sharing with you today. Briefly, the Connected Intelligence Center at the University of Technology, Sydney, is a new center just over two years old, um, initiated by the University of Technology, Sydney, to help the university think about how we use analytics to improve the student experience as well as how analytics can transform business and uh, research activities more broadly. So what we are doing is working across the university with many different kinds of stakeholders to help them think about data and analytics. We are teaching what we call human-centered data science, um, which is particularly concerned with the ways in which humans will relate to machines in the future, as uh, we will be hearing a little bit later on in this talk. Um, the emergence of data analytics and AI in society has profound implications, and we are developing a master's course now, just coming up for two years old, to try and teach students how to conduct data science in a human-centered way. We design practical tools for the university, uh, evaluate these, conduct research, and disseminate the findings uh, internally as well as internationally. And overall, we are very interested in what the impact of big data will be in education, and especially this notion of human-centered analytics in society. And you'll be hearing a bit more about that as we proceed. Well, first of all, let's think about why is everybody so interested in 21st century skills, competencies, dispositions, qualities, there are many words for this. And I'd like to suggest that two key drivers, one is the nature of the problems we now face, and secondly, the uh, shifting picture of what the future of the workplace will be, especially with the emergence of AI. Now, the notion of wicked problem is pro probably one that you have come across. It's been studied since the 60s by the um, urban planning academic at UC Berkeley, Horst Rittel. Um, a wicked problem, I've borrowed a definition here from my colleague Jeff Conklin, is one for which every attempt to create a solution changes the understanding of the problem. And the wickedness, which is the opposite of being a tame problem, a wicked problem is so complex because of the social context in which it sits and because of the diversity of the stakeholders. Now, these are the kinds of problems that we now face in society uh, at many different scales. The term has moved from the world of academia into mainstream public policy. Here's just one example of an Australian government document on the challenge of tackling wicked problems for policy formulation. And indeed, um, techniques for tackling problems that are wicked are now well out of the academic lab and are being used by consultants with real outcomes. And I've provided you with a link to uh, one um, of my uh, inspirations, the work by Paul Colmsey and Kailash Awati, who document the work that they've been doing using a whole range of different problem structuring and um, mapping techniques. Intriguingly, also in the 1960s, 
was the work of Doug Engelbart, um, who, if you don't know, invented many of the features of personal interactive computing that we now take for granted. Uh, I urge you to go to the dogengelbart.org if you've never seen the uh, astounding demonstration he gave in 1968, which really foresaw the future of interactive computing. And I'm showing you this um, because uh, we are, of course, interested in the role of technology for what Engelbart would call boosting mankind's capability for coping with complex, urgent problems. You can see that at the top. Engelbart, a real inspiration for me, emphasized what we might call IA in contrast to AI. IA being intelligence augmentation, where we are using machines to augment personal and collective intelligence to tackle wicked problems. So those that sets the sort of context for a lot of the work that I've done over the years. Now the second driver, and of course I'm going very quickly here, and many people have written at length and in detail about the shifting workplace of the future. Here's just one example from the Institute for, for the Future, where they talk about a number of drivers in the stars there. You can see the rise of smart machines and systems down in the left there, obviously very interesting to us, interested in learning analytics. But they talk about um, the extreme um, longevity of, uh, of, of the human work life now, the degree of connectedness we have in the world, etc. And then interestingly, they start talking about the key skills that will be needed in the future in order to thrive in this kind of environment. And this is really where we start talking about 21st century skills, competencies, qualities, etc. This is the list that the Institute for the Future came out with. I won't go through those in detail, but many of those qualities you will uh, recognize from the numerous frameworks that are now out there. And uh, this talk will not review or detail or seek to definitively define 21st century competencies. This will become clear as I, as I go through this. I'll also be giving you many links en route, which you can follow up from the slides afterwards. So the challenge then is how do we, as people interested in learning analytics, design systems which could nurture these kinds of qualities? So we are clearly talking about more than simply training students to use new technology, tra training them how to search, etc. We're, we're talking about habits of mind, um, ways of working together, the ability to balance a great difference in culture or perspective, um, self-regulation, collaboration skills. I'm going to focus on dispositions here for a moment. Let's go way back past 1960s. Let's go back to Dewey. Dewey spoke about the need for the learner to have the desire and the will to employ his or her knowledge of methods. It's not just enough to know about them, you have to be ready to use them when an opportunity arrives. This desire is an affair of personal disposition, Dewey wrote. And this notion of learning dispositions is a critical one, which uh, many people are now talking about in different ways. It's not just knowledge and skills, it's dispositions as well. Here's Larry Rosenstock, an inspirational school principal from High Tech High. Dispositions come into play in the innovation economy. Your readiness to collaborate. That's not just your knowledge of how to collaborate, but are you actually ready to? Your attention to multiple perspectives. How much initiative you have. We'll hear about agency, another word for that in a moment. Your persistence. Many people talk about resilience as well your curiosity. Or here are my colleagues Ruth Deacon Crick and Chris Goldspink who have studied in detail um, learners orientation to their um, to their learning and they talk about the orientation towards the unknown uncertainty and ambiguity. Are you the kind of learner are you teaching the kinds of students who retreat from this kind of complexity or who move into it and are ready to step out into the unknown. 
So, a very quick introduction to the kinds of skills and qualities that we're talking about here. This brings us to learning analytics. What are we talking about? Well, this is the Learning Analytics Summer Institute, so I'm not going to spend much time defining learning analytics in general terms. Um, let me just say that for me, this is a form of computational social science to the extent that learning and education are forms of social endeavor that we study and seek to discipline and design. So obviously, we are talking about computing and data sciences. Obviously, we're talking about learning and the fields that conduct research into the processes and design and delivery of learning. And I would add one more. For me, we have to think about human-centered design. I'm calling human-centered informatics, the design of artificial and human systems that process information. It's absolutely critical that we are designing our analytics not only to be usable, but to give power and voice to the stakeholders, and that we take very seriously the sense-making that must go on around any kind of dashboard that somebody is going to try and put in front of you. And work that I did with Simon Knight and my colleague Karen Littleton at the Open University, no learning analytics system is neutral. You cannot escape the, uh, the triad of uh, epistemology, pedagogy, and assessment. And for us, this is uh, the middle, a way of talking about the middle space that learning analytics sits in. And an attention to these leads us to ask questions like this. Well, an analytic system has a model of the world and it pays attention to certain kinds of activity and ignores others. These are a commitments to this different parts of this triangle. What do you care about and what do you ignore? Moreover, do your analytics value the same things as the official assessment regime? So there is no point in us talking about 21st century skills if in the end we're going to sit down the students and give them a three hour exam with pen and paper. Our, la our learning analytics systems must synchronize and be integrated with the assessment regime if it's going to have any real value. And we might ask, well, who gets to see the analytics? Are these education dashboards for learners or just for the educators? And what does this say about our pedagogy? So there's a lot more detail there available for you um, if you want to follow that up. Well, what's special about 21st century learning analytics as opposed to the kinds of analytics you might simply see in your dashboard from your learning management system? Well, let me try and give you some examples and some ways of thinking about this. Well, Here's an overall orientation that, that, that we're taking here at KIC, uh, which I offer to you. So when we think about the future of work, clearly analytics are going to be aggregating low level data and AI is beginning to automate lower order routine cognitive skill. So I suggest that one way that we can think about this is that we have to move to the higher ground because the machines are occupying the lower ground. And this might take a number of forms. For example, we need to train data scientists to combine the power of algorithmic intelligence with the intrinsic human skills that make humans human and special and aren't about to be automated, at least not anytime soon. Secondly, we need to deploy as learning analytics people all the educational and data science expertise we have to try and cultivate those higher order qualities. So rather than panic simply that the machines are going to take over, let's harness the power of the machines to build our qualities um, to higher levels. And I, I summarize that as cultivating those higher qualities that are distinctively human and devise practical authentic ways to evidence them. So when we think about all those kinds of qualities that the Institute for the Future were talking about, or those dispositions we were just looking at, can we evidence them? 
this for me is one of the most exciting possibilities for learning analytics. That for the first time, we will be able to create rigorous evidence bases that show the extent to which somebody is capable of some of these uh, uh, ways of acting, behaving, learning, collaborating, thinking, questioning, etc. Another common way of talking about this is the uh, the T-shaped graduate. So on the left there, so underneath you can see the vertical expertise that we need, we need graduates to have, at least in one discipline, and that is the traditional degree. But uh, and in, from a learning analytics perspective, this is the most amenable kind of knowledge that can be modeled, for example, in an adaptive learning system, an intelligent tutoring system. But all this attention now is increasingly on the boundary crossing competencies, the horizontal competencies, the transferable competencies. And this is where learning analytics can give us some help, I suppose. Let's see what that might look like. Okay, well, first of all, let's start with the relatively simple, in technical terms, approach that's well established in education, of course. And this is to ask students how things are going, or and or to observe them. So here's an example of a survey from my colleague, Ruth Deacon Crick, called Clara, which is seeking to assess students' resilient agency. You can see the kinds of questions that um, are asked, about 40 of them. And the difference here is that as an analytics tool, it returns immediate visual feedback to the student. It also generates a whole data set for the cohort that can be analyzed. And you can see on that spider diagram some of those dimensions which are of great interest to us when we think about 21st century learning. It turns out that mindful agency is a real driving variable in the whole process. And that means taking responsibility for my own learning over time through defining my purposes, understanding and managing my feelings, knowing how I go about learning, planning my learning journey carefully. And those questions I've popped up there show you how the survey items load onto that scale. Again, you can read all the detail in the British Journal of Educational Studies. Interestingly, here's another view which shows from structural equation modeling how mindful agency is a central driver for many of the other dimensions. This immediately begs the question whether our epistemology, pedagogy and assessment practices, that triangle I referred to, are building that kind of agency or crushing it out of our students, a common criticism of our school and higher education systems. Here's another example from Daryl Thompson at UTS. Here we are seeing the review system, which um, seeks to break down the obsession that students have, and it's not their fault because the system drives them to this, to focus on their grade. But the question is, why did you get the grade that you have? Can you visualize that? And you can see here one scheme which breaks down the subject performance into a range of different competencies. Moreover, review provides an interface for students to assess themselves on an assignment after they've submitted it using the slider, that's the blue triangle, as well as to see how they benchmarked against the whole cohort, which is the grey triangle, and then actually what, how their assessment calibrates against the actual grade they got. And if we think about the work of David Bowd and colleagues, then the idea of sustainable assessment is that really our goal is to help students assess themselves and the work of their peers as accurately as an expert would in the domain. When they can do that, they've developed not only mastery of understanding what good looks like in their field, but they've developed a lifelong learning capability. Another example from Robin Nodge, who is a, a school, works in a high school here in Sydney. Robin has developed 
a methodology and a visualization technique that doesn't just track academic performance, which is on the y-axis here, but also the student's effort. And uh, he argues in this paper that the power of giving students visual feedback on how their effort has developed is very powerful. And I encourage you to go to that website to uh, review the visualization there. And this is the effort tracking rubric which uh, the school uses, which has been through many iterations to try and help teachers assess uh, the, uh, the effort that students are putting in, in through a very quick web-based interface. So, observation and self-report are obviously very important. Uh, they give insight into how a learner sees their progress, and obviously educators have strong views about what they see when they observe te uh, students. But, of course, a lot of the excitement about learning analytics is that we can go from these kinds of approaches to looking at the actual behavior of students and try and make some sense of that. Now, the question is exactly how do we, uh, how do we uh, develop meaningful activity measures which connect to those kinds of high order competencies and qualities that we were looking at earlier? And the essence of this could be summed up in the little expression from clicks to constructs. How do we go from the kinds of things that you get in a system log and make some kind of interpretive claim that this corresponds to something happen at the level of a construct like curiosity or diligence or um, uh, critical thinking? Okay, how are people tackling this? Let's have a look at some examples. Here's Val Schut. Um, who has been developing educational gaming systems for children. And there's a quality called conscientiousness that she cares about. How would we develop a measure of conscientiousness amongst the learners? So we start with the construct. She then breaks this down into some um, unobservable sub-constructs like persistence, perfectionism, organization, and carefulness. Some of those might be further refined. And then finally, we get to the level of the indicators, the observable behavioral traces. And you can see how those are defined. That for example, persistence is how much time the student spends tackling an unsolved problem or how many times they revisit it rather than just giving up. Okay, so that gives you a simple visual example of how we go from clicks to constructs from uh, in a gaming environment. Here's another one from uh, the team working on the Chicago schools um, platform for developing um, a range of different multimedia skills amongst school students. So they have this digital youth network theme um, around creative production, self-directed learning, and social learning. I hope you'll agree those are high order constructs, the kinds of qualities that we want students to develop. Okay, we break this down into a number of opportunities the student can have. For example, these are the learning opportunities they may have around creative production. This is what they define as social learning. And finally, we get to the actual actions that are logged in the iRemix platform. And this are, of course, the sorts of things that you would see in a system log. So the process is one of trying to operationalize your construct in terms of actual behavioral technique, uh, behavioral trace. Here's a visual picture of what they do, where they're looking at essentially triples, where an actor um, engages in some kind of um, activity in relation to some other person. Okay, and from that they code that um, they are there's some evidence of an opportunity for learning going on there, which maps to one of the themes driving the whole uh, digital youth network system. So, for example, if a student reads 
the video of one of his or her peers, then they're going to code that as exploring the work of others, which is part of social learning. On the other hand, if the student engages in a video-based activity of around their own work, then we're going to code that as revising work, and that's part of the creative production skill set. And so I've just highlighted here that um, depending on who the recipient of the action is um, determines how they code that. Here's another example from Sandra Milligan and Patrick Griffin at Melbourne University. Their interest is in MOOCs and they have decided to try and quantify a 21st century capability they call crowdsourced learning. It's the ability to eff effectively learn in a MOOC-like context, which of course is very different from learning in a, a conventional course. And so their interest is in defining a, a spectrum uh, from novice through to beginner, emergent, competent, and then expert, you can't see that yet, on a number of different dimensions, one of them being epistemic standpoint. So you can see that at this end of the continuum, the, the, the learner has a relatively uh, straightforward belief that the goal of learning is to master stable, objective, generalizable knowledge and understandings as defined by experts. Down at the other end, they see learning very differently. I won't read all of that out, but you can see that uh, it's a much richer, broader, deeper notion of what learning entails. And then we can fill in the cells and actually talk about how that breaks down into sub-constructs. Here are the sub-constructs at the other end of the continuum. Okay. And then the, there's, the, there's the whole thing. Uh, you can go look at that at your leisure later on. But you can see there's an orientation around epistemic standpoint we were just looking at, but also another one to teaching and learning, another one around regulation of learning. Great, okay, so there's, there's our uh, sort of rubric-based framework for talking about this CSL capability. How do we actually interpret um, the data? So there is part of uh, one of the, the constructs broken down into sub-constructs. Um, there are a number of different behavioral indicators that they have defined, but we are not yet at the system log level. Um, they are deriving a number of variables from that. So for example, uh, the patterns of reuse of syllabus guides, uh, is operationalized further as the number of accesses of a study guide. Uh, peer response to votes to posts is broken down into three subcategories. And then finally, they set thresholds for the kinds of behavioral trace that they care about. Okay, hopefully you're getting the picture here. Okay, high level constructs mapped through some kind of rationale which may be derived from the literature, intuition, knowledge about particular student cohorts, or some combination of all of those, mapped from constructs down to actual behaviors. Here's a different example from uh, Chen and Zhang, um, who are very interested in learner agency, there's that word again, and what they call design mode thinking. This is work grounded in the rich tradition of work that came out of um, uh, Marlene Escardamalia and Baraita's work at OISI in Toronto. So we have a knowledge structuring environment with, whereby students are creating essentially semantic knowledge maps. The creation of a semantic knowledge map of nodes and links means that the system has got um, much greater access to uh, understanding the kinds of moves the students are making in a conversation as they build their knowledge. And so here we see um, on the top that there is a note and the student has highlighted a particular aspect of it um, as being interesting. It's a promising idea, what they call a promising idea. And by aggregating the promising ideas, um, in a visualization, then uh, a visual 
a sort of trace like this is created, which feeds back to the learner the kinds of key ideas they've been highlighting or that their peers have been highlighting and um, how they connect. Or a different example, the students um, are given scaffolds like my theory dot 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 I need to understand dot 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 a better theory dot 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 those are prefixes to the contributions they make to the conversation and simply by aggregating the extent to which they have used those um, those scaffolds immediately shows the student the extent to which they are perhaps overusing one kind of uh, scaffold and um, not really talking about other kinds. Okay, moving swiftly on then, let's think about a completely different um, uh, kind of, of learning that we care about. So this is where we're interested in how students are not only using their minds and clicking, but of course man many important kinds of learning involve one's body. So, for example, we are now working um, uh, on instrumenting collaborative spaces, face-to-face -face spaces, but developing um, sensors that can detect what's going on in the room, trying to analyze those, and trying to give timely feedback to students. So here's uh, some examples from my colleague, Roberto Martinez Maldonado. And... Here's a particular example of that where we might have students around a mannequin uh, simulating a patient. To what extent could we give useful feedback to the students about where they were, who was talking more, uh, what kinds of activities were going on, and, how, and, and, and the appropriateness of those different um, physical uh, behaviors in relation to the learning. So out of a sit... Um, an instrumented space of this sort, we would get voice, gesture, pen, touch data potentially, which all then need to be integrated, analyzed, and then rendered in some suitable form for um, an educator or perhaps for the students themselves. And here's a quick example of some of the work that uh, Roberto was doing several years ago now, which where these radar charts show three students and they show the extent to which students were physically active or dominating um, uh, the contributions to the interactive surface table, for example. Um, the interesting questions then, of course, are, well, does uh, more verbal participation or physical participation mean better learning? Not necessarily, of course. Um, but for the first time, we can actually visualize and reflect on this in a way that was previously completely ephemeral. Um, we're very interested in surface-based collaboration analytics. Here's another example from the University of Sydney. Again, generating feedback which shows um, uh, the kinds of uh, activity going on and, and the kinds of um, um, problem solving. Very interesting work in this example from um, Stanford University from Paolo Blickstein's group. Um, here they are looking at pairs of students working with physical objects, but they are analyzing the student's posture. And what you see here is this uh, fascinating ability that they now have to determine the posture of the student from active on the left passive in the middle there and a semi-active one where there's one hand on the table and then they were able to show that active postures were more positively associated with student learning gains while passive ones were negatively correlated. So the very fact that we can now visualize these kinds of uh, qualities of, of, of a student's behavior is opens up some very exciting new possibilities that mean, means that learning no longer needs to be defined purely as what's going on in the mind or what we can pick up through a keyboard. Another example here, a field exercise. Let's move outside. We don't have to be indoors to be learning, of course. And as you walk around this environment, examining the trees, 
no longer um, are we limited to simply seeing what students record in traditional ways, but we can actually determine whether they were looking up at the right moments, whether they were down on their knees, digging around in the roots at the right moments, etc. This is work from, from Okada and Tada in Japan. Let's think about one of those communication skills that people talk about so much now, and this is clear, critical, or reflective writing. Um, Writing is, as I've suggested here, a window onto the mind, and arguably it's one of the most commonly used windows onto the mind to try and discern whether students are learning what we want them to learn and becoming the kinds of people we want them to become. Here at uh, UTS we have become very interested in this and um, um, are uh, developing tools to try and give rapid formative feedback to students about the quality of their writing. This is an example or interface from our AWA tool, which is recognizing common rhetorical moves made in academic scholarly writing. For example, the green sentence there is, is a, a, you know, a classic sort of signposting statement, which tells the reader what is to come in the article. You might also see these green sentences at the end of a section when you summarize what you've been saying before you move on to the next section. So it keeps the reader oriented. Uh, down on the right hand side here you can see the kinds of moves that um, often occur in scholarly academic writing and these are essentially the contributions that the article claims to be making. Um, if you do not make these kinds of moves very clear to the reader, then um, they're left wondering, well, what was the contribution there? And we have been piloting this a little bit with some of our students. Here is some examples of student feedback when we asked them, what's it like to get feedback like this from a machine? This is going way beyond spelling, grammar, and plagiarism checking, of course. Well, here's one example student like this because it's sort of less emotional. Um, it can be a bit embarrassing to get very critical feedback from a, a person about your writing. Um, a student gains some insight into their writing that they weren't um, using justification very much. Uh, another student um, again gains some insight into how they organize their writing. Um, now it's very important to emphasize that uh, there, were also, there was also negative feedback from the students where the machine was clearly um, stretched and beyond, beyond its limits, missing where they were doing a good job. And we emphasized to our students that um, it is just a machine, it's a prototype, and it has no idea whether they're talking nonsense either. So they should not read too much into whether they, the machine is grading them. We are explicitly not grading them but we're trying to make them consciously aware of the kinds of patterns that are visible in their writing. We're also very interested in reflective writing, which is a very different genre of writing from, from basically demonstrating what you do know. In reflective writing, often you share what you're experiencing or feeling or you're, what, what you're not sure of, and also how you are changing as a person or intend to change in the future. So it's the complete opposite of demonstrating your mastery of some uh, curriculum, but rather showing how you're developing as a learner. And uh, at UTS, we're very interested in how we develop our students as professional, uh, in, instill a professional disposition amongst them right from day one. So the kinds of things that you would say in reflective writing are perhaps about the learning context and what effects it's having on you. There's an example, or expressions reflecting specifically on changes in learning. Here, the student is talking about developing goals, becoming aware of their cultural viewpoints and how to overcome, presumably, their biases. Um, reflecting on um, the difference, perhaps, between what they learned in the classroom and what they've learned out in practice, actually 
in an organization or teaching or being in a hospital for the first time. Verbs that we are looking for are showing these kinds of awareness shifts, shifts in perception. I could see, I began to become aware, I could visualize, I began to understand. So these are signals that something interesting is going on in the learner's mind. And if we think about what we really care about in higher education, indeed in any education, surely one of the most exciting symptoms that we're looking for is that we have unsettled a previously fixed perspective and that the learners are now seeing the world in a new way. And so here's an example from um, work we presented earlier this year at the Learning Analytics Conference. And you can see an example here where the student says, it prompted me to question to what extent I as a nurse should recommend analgesia, drawing on what I had been taught about the effective control of pain. And the system is picking up that this seems to be something to do with class, that is a reference to the syllabus. This is a good rather than a specific, it's a specific reflection rather than a vague one because the, it prompted me to question something specifically. And there's actually been a shift in awareness or perception of some sort. So a very different set of categories here compared to traditional, scholarly, academic, third-person, critical writing. Okay, so let me just try and wrap up now with some concluding thoughts. I've shown you some examples of approaches that people are taking to tackle the challenge of developing analytics for 21st century competencies. What are some of the big messages? Well, the first one I think that jumps out is we are interested here in multiple kinds of intelligence and holistic learning. We've gone way beyond uh, analytics that simply log the mastery of a particular competence, important as that is, um, in terms of you know maths, grammar, spelling, um, the domain of um, knowledge-based systems, which have modeled some of the curriculum to great, in great depth. We're interested in multiple ways of knowing, and in fact, that's an important aspect of a 21st century learner. We're also interested in a holistic conception of the learner. I'd like to draw your attention to the work that Randy Bass has been doing. Um, and there are a couple of links there to a, a series on reinventing the university, which he led and uh, a series of video roundtable discussions. And then at Georgetown, um, Randy is leading a uh, program called Formation by Design. Again, thinking about the uh, a more holistic conception of what higher education is for, and together with that, what the kinds of metrics and analytics should be that honor a holistic perspective of that sort. I'd like to suggest that in the times that we're living in now, that skepticism is the default position for many of our learners, and indeed that should be the case, and uh, that that demands a level of transparency around learning analytics, which we've yet to really um, see and develop. So let's pretend for a moment that we really did want to create these 21st century learners. What might they be? Well, they are skeptical of tracking technology and the imposition of authority. Um, and though this may translate into, for example, looking to game the analytics and wanting to know what's in the black box. They want to be creative. So to what extent do our analytics encourage thinking outside the box? Um, they may want to use all sorts of different tools. Do our analytics dictate that they only need to use or should use or can use one tool? And Kirsty Keto's talk uh, will unpack the implications of thinking about a heterogeneous ecology of tools and learning analytics. 
These students care about where the world's going. They are passionate and they want to make a difference. So our learning experiences need to be as authentic as possible and our analytics need to work in those contexts. 21st century learners understand the importance of diversity for solving complex, wicked problems. These are the qualities that we're instilling in our first year undergraduates now at UTS with some very exciting results as we introduce transdisciplinary learning. And again, we need to ask, well, do analytics assume that uh, there's going to be just one correct answer? Can analytics help students build this kind of transdisciplinary, multi-perspectival multi approach to complex problem solving? Can they use their collective intelligence to negotiate a solution? Can the analytics gain any insight into the effectiveness by which they're doing that? These students value their autonomy, but they really do want to belong to a community. Of course, that's what they're paying for when they actually shell out their student fees, as opposed to just doing a MOOC. They want a sense of belonging and support, but they want to exercise their agency as well. Do our analytics have an ontology, a data model, a set of patterns that correspond to any of these complex notions? And I suggest that 21st century learners understand the importance of reflection and contemplation if they're to grow as people. So increasingly, when we look at leadership, we find people who understand that they need space as well to balance the hyper-accelerated pace of life. What could learning analytics offer for contemplation and reflection? Perhaps, I suggest, the focus on reflective writing is part of that jigsaw. That how you narrate yourself, your personal identity, and the sense you're making of the world is absolutely essential to who you think you are, where you think you're going, and how you're making sense of your whole educational experience. Another implication of this skepticism is that we need to be understanding, well, what would it mean for our analytics not to be a black box, but to be accountable, both to educators and to learners? And there's a link here to another talk which explores that thorny problem. So we want our students to be skeptical and pushing back against the machines. Um, and the very act of trying to game analytics to figure out how they're working, to question and uh, be skeptical and debate whether the data is accurate, whether the analytics are drawing appropriate inferences and classifications. That is a 21st century skill that we need in our data saturated society. And learning analytics should work with that rather than worry that that's going to completely disrupt the effectiveness of the analytics. Could we design analytics that are meant to be gamed? The very process of trying to game the analytics should actually be an effective learning process. And I'll just throw this out there. If you look at the Clue Train manifesto on the way that markets are changing and the relationship between very smart citizens and business is changing. Scrolling down through the manifesto, I've just picked out a few of the, uh, the assertions that are in that provocative document. And I think it's kind of fun to think about this kind of attitude to the way we think about analytics and how we co-design them with educators and learners. We've talked about wickedness, complexity, uncertainty, ambiguity. These um, are all part of the nature of an extremely complex world now. And students have to learn to work with ambiguity. 
I'm drawing from my uh, colleague, Teresa Anderson, here at UTS, who specializes in the role of handling uncertainty in the creation of creative students and creativity more broadly. And I, uh, I commend this uh, talk she gave to those of you who are interested in, in that. I'm also very interested in the work that's going on in liminal space. Liminal space is that space when you've left the tried and true behind, but you're not quite sure what's going to replace it. And I love this quote from Richard Rohr, who talks about training people in how to hold anxiety, live with ambiguity, and trust that even though it's uncomfortable, things will actually clarify. But there's no way of avoiding the cloud of unknowing, as he puts it, being a Franciscan priest. So this is the, uh, the uncertain space that we now take our students into as we train them in data science, for example. And they have to learn to trust that this actually is going to be OK, and that what they're doing is they're actually learning a core competency. So to wrap up, I'm going to suggest that 21st century analytics could shift our assessment regimes because those are, I propose, the stranglehold on the future of our education systems. Students and educators are driven by assessment and 21st century learning analytics have the potential to create an evidence base for these qualities that many educators have written about for many, many years as being important, but which are now more critical than ever. But if the assessment regimes are completely out of sync with the attention we want to give to these new qualities, then the power of 21st century learning analytics will be somewhat strangled because the, the broader organizational and policy system will not be interested in them. And students may ask, why should I care about what these analytics are saying? Because in the end, it doesn't contribute to what you seem to value. If you'd like to go deeper into many of the examples I've shown you, then um, you can take a look at the new special section of the Journal of Learning Analytics, which was just published. And you will see a lot more detail there. And of course, much more data, theory and literature underpinning these ideas. I hope you found this interesting, and I very much welcome any feedback you have. Thank you very much.